Coming up on this week's show, your help is needed to complete a 40-year-old unfinished game. A next-generation GameCube memory card is here. And we chat Age of Empires 2 and the founding of Xbox Live with Mark Torano. And the Retro Hour podcast is brought to you every week with our wonderful mates at Bitmap Books. Now, crazily, can you believe Donkey Kong 3 was released in arcades 40 years ago this week? And you can check out the side art for it and many more in their incredible book that celebrates the golden age of arcades, Artcade. You can buy that right now and check out the rest of their retro gaming collection. Have a look at bitmapbooks.com. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 383, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And a very warm welcome to the podcast that every single Friday celebrates the classic days of video games. Basically, of this sound... Makes you all warm and tingly. You're in the right place, yeah? Yeah, yeah, especially with this week's episode. <laughs> well, that's what we do on this podcast. I mean, we do a little round table. If you're a regular listener, you'll know how this works. If you're new to it, first half of the show, we bring you up to speed on what's been happening in the world of retro gaming and technology from over the last week. Because it's a really busy scene these days. And, you know, we appreciate everyone's busy. Not everyone's got time to hang out on Twitter all week and Reddit, you know, what there is on Reddit these days, and uh, check all the blogs and Facebook pages. So we do that for you. We bring you up to speed with the headlines. And then in the second half of the podcast, that is when we welcome on a very special guest. Now, I've got a feeling that Joe was uh, quite in his element this week, because um, before you did the recording with our interviewee this week, I actually recorded a little bit of Joe, just kind of warming up for it. Oh, yeah, no. a or oh, ben- Benito, <laughs> a prosmatica, <laughs> oh, <wallaloo. laughs> Very good, Joe. Why, why would you do this to me? That's <laughs> they, they, Just for context, they weren't that close together, like our guest was talking back to me, you know, and he found it funny. It wasn't just me being a complete weirdo. So uh, that's that's <laughs> stuff off the uh, off the cutting room floor of our. It is off the cut, so, cutting yeah. room floor. Yeah. And, but, uh, what surprised me, Joe, was you know I'm usually the PC RPG and strategy guy, and then Joe suddenly comes out with this huge knowledge of. Uh, Age of Empires series and Age of Mythology and these great impressions as well. <laughs> yeah, so this week's guest was uh, Mark Tarano, who um, I didn't realise how huge his career was. Ravi got him on and Ravi says, oh, do you want to jump on this one, Joe? And I says, yeah, 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 that'd be brilliant. Age of Empires, I love that. But he's had such an amazing career, you know. So he started off working on like banking systems and you know kind of like you know behind the scenes with a lot of like you know computer analytics and stuff like that but then kind of landed himself a job uh, working on Age of Empires and then you know kind of moved on to the lead designer of Age of Empires 2 which I I grew up with Age of Empires 2 absolutely adored it but then what really really blew my mind um, ended up working for Microsoft and uh, actually helped launch Xbox Live for you know the original Xbox Xbox 360 mm. And he was actually even there, bit of a spoiler here. He was in the boardroom when they came up with the idea for achievements, which at the time was apparently a, just a little thing. They came up with yeah. a little idea and went on to be such a huge thing. So this interview has got to be one of my favourite interviews I've ever I've, done. I think the consistent theme throughout the whole of this interview is networking. Mm. And kind of that idea of, you know, multiplayer games, but also doing it over the internet. Like yeah. coming from Age of Empires 2 as well, which was pioneering in that one yeah. and then going to xbox but then doing stuff like defense grid as well which was a amazing game that came yeah. out on xbox and then later on they did a crowdfunding and it got a million pounds for that and it was a huge success ensemble studios as well and then going on to you know a small game called a counter strike go as well so, yeah um, it's go yeah just a little game he worked on yeah so yeah. a huge career here and it's a, a really interesting story actually to kind of hear the development of that stuff and uh, where it led to even the stories about the you know the initial kind of concept of the xbox and you know playing it online i love the when he was talking about you know their decision to put an ethernet connector on there because obviously we had the dreamcast before that which out of the box came with a, a dial up modem ad- adapter didn't it and that was you know really i mean you think high speed kind of broadband not many people had that in like 2001, 2002. So it was very forward looking 
And uh, really interesting to see some, some kind of, you know, those boardroom decisions mm. that led to that as well from Mark. So um, I really enjoyed this chat. I know you're going to as well. Mark Tirano, a special guest, talking about Age of Empires 2, the founding of Xbox Live, all that and more coming up on the show. He'll be on in around half an hour from now. And I've got to say, Rev, you're sounding surprisingly relaxed considering your massive event is <laughs> coming up next weekend. Kickstart, the uh, huge Amiga show, the first dedicated Amiga event in almost 10 years that is going to be on next weekend in Nottingham. Yeah, yeah. So up for it? Uh, first one in a, in, a, in a while in the UK. And uh, yeah, I, it's all of it's all a front. I'm, I'm <laughs> really nervous behind the scenes, but um, I've got like everything sorted, actually. So it's, it's quite nice being in this position and a lot of tickets have sold and it's just going to be fantastic. By the time you listen to this, it will be it'll be next week. And mm. uh it's going to be pretty amazing. Uh, I can't wait for it, really. And to be honest, I think everyone else is going to have fun, but I'm going to be working. So yeah. <laughs> um, I've 100%. kind of shot myself in the foot there. I probably want to enjoy the event more than anyone, but I'll probably be running around and doing all this setting up things and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, it's going to be really cool. And then there's going to be another event that um, I'm going to be heading back to because you guys can't actually make this one. And this is the... Uh, Nordic's largest retro gaming convention, and that's Retro Mesa. But we decided we're going to bring a special guest along as well and uh, introduce him to this great event, and that's uh, Neil from RMC. So that's going to mm. be a good laugh. We'll be up there on the uh, 19th and 20th of August in uh, Sandefjord in Norway, and uh, they've got some pretty amazing guests already. They've, they, of course, they've got the uh, rare band that are playing, but they've also got Jonathan Dunn as well. Um, from this kind of C64 and uh, Ocean Software. You're going to be recording these panels when you're there, aren't you, for the show? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, it, it's going to be really good fun. I, I can't wait to um, get Neil drunk on, um, you know, Jägermeister and <laughs> that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, last year we were at this event. I mean, you know, the, the crowd there, they're the definitely party people, aren't they? And I think, what did, what did we work out? Cause I kept handing Ravi all my, my shots at the after party because I must admit I'm a bit of a lightweight. I can't do shots. And after Ravi, dad, like, about six i think you kind of lost track didn't you so yeah, uh, yeah. You're, you're gonna basically pass him to neil this time is that your yeah i kind of survived but but yeah, yeah. The, the norwegian <laughs> people turn into vikings at a certain point of yeah. the night <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, lots of events coming up throughout the summer. If you want to, uh, if you're in the Norway area, show me and Joe can't actually make it out. So we have uh, prior engagements this year, but I'm sure you and Neil will have an amazing time. Um, we'll put ticket links for that. And of course, uh, kickstart in Nottingham next weekend on the 1st and 2nd of July. There are still some last minute tickets available. Is that right? Uh, yeah, online? there's tickets for Sunday still, and we might yeah. do some um, Sunday roll-ups on the door, but it will usually be if you, if you purchase it online, you should be able to, you know, scan your QR code on the door yeah, and uh, get your wristband and all of that. It's amigashow.com. Okay, cool. If you, uh, if you want to get tickets for that and you can make it to Nottingham next weekend, uh, all us three are going to be there, so we will see you there. Right, then lots of news to get into this week, so let's jump straight in. Now, I know you guys um, often kind of you know spend a bit of time in game shops and charity shops and... Or you know, my call them thrift stores, op shops in different parts of the world. Generally, I've got to admit, I don't see all that much exciting stuff. I think the, the best find I've had in a charity shop recently was a uh, a Microsoft ergonomic keyboard from 1995. That was one of my best finds I've had over the last few months. Um, but what about this though? Someone's actually found a very rare Sega Dreamcast development kit in a recycling store. Yeah, this this is kind of like one of those like mind blowing things like and i really really want to know the story behind it so apparently mm. the store have just said it was a donation um but this has been spotted out in the wild by a twitter user uh, goes by uh, dmg deeb and uh, he's posted this and it's you know picked up some traction like you say it's in a recycling shop but it's not just like sat on for sale it is like in the museum section of the recycling yeah. shop so it's it's a computer recycling shop and uh, like i say it was donated to them, but it's not just like, oh, it's part of the dev kit. It includes the GD writer, you know, for like the CDs, a HKT-04 development box and HKT-01 development box, actual Dreamcast unit, Dreamcast keyboard, and then also a development disc uh, for a Japanese uh, exclusive photo editor that they used as well as part of the dev kit. So it's like an entire development kit. 
I'm not too sure where this recycling shop is. Uh, yeah, uh, it's it's called RePC, and uh, this Re-PC. is the, the this is the Katana development kit, and I've only ever seen these in museums before, actually. Yeah. So, like, I've never seen one of these out in the wild or at a show, you know. So they're just massively rare, and to have that, you know, GD ROM writer in there as well, like that's mm. that's a Dreamcast pirate's dream. That is to have, <laughs> have this machine. Yeah. Um, interestingly, one sold last year on eBay. And when I say one, it was just a development box. One part of this kit sold on eBay for just under $2,300. So $2,296.77, the back end of 2022. So it's worth some money as well. Um, So the shop have said that they're going to let some YouTubers come and, you know, film it and, you know, discuss it and kind of get the get the scoop and stuff like that. And once that's all done and the dust is settled, they have said they're going to sell it now. They kind of know what it is. It's, it's in such good condition as well. It doesn't look mm. like, you know, something you'd find that's got wear and tear. It looks like new old stock, like it's it's just not been touched. It, it looks mm. like it doesn't even need retro writing, you know. Yeah, I've never seen a Dreamcast that looks that nice, never mind a development kit. <laughs> and it looks beautiful as well. It's basically like a, a MIDI PC tower, isn't it? And then yeah. you've got a separate kind of drive unit that sits on top of it, all in that kind of Dreamcast creamy beige colour. Um, got the Dreamcast logo on there, the Sega logos as well. I mean, this doesn't look like... I mean, you see some dev kits that are basically, you know, a few motherboards kind of <laughs> nailed to a bit of plywood. This doesn't look like that. This is a proper, you know, development kit that a, a developer, a AAA developer would use back in the day by the looks of it. Um, looks really complete. I'm looking as well at this uh, this guy on Twitter, this uh, DMG Deeb. He's, he's from America by the looks of it. He says he's in um, Northwest Pacific. Okay. In uh, Pacific Northwest in USA. So, yeah, I mean, I kind of assume this will be in America, not over here. Um, so nothing we're going to be able to see in person anytime soon by the looks of it. But it does... Um, I'm looking at this, yeah, and, and originally I thought it was it's kind of found in a, in a thrift kind of store, but it does look like this is a, a company, obviously a PC recycling company. They know what they've got. Okay. It's not going to be something they're going to sell for like a dollar and, you know, someone's going to kind of rip them off. Yeah. They're very aware of what it is. It looks like it's in like a glass cabinet, and like you said, they're going to let some kind of YouTubers film it, and then I imagine it'll go for all. It's, it's not a load of grannies that. like, we've got a Sega. Yeah. yeah. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Do you want a Sega for $30? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So hopefully whoever uh, gave it to them, uh, you know, got, got their reward and understood what they were donating. I'm sure they did. Very cool, though. If you are in that area, definitely something to uh, go along and have a look at in person. Now, this is very cool. I mean, uh, <laughs> I don't know about you guys. I've got lots of projects, you know, stuff that I start that I haven't got around to finishing. Some of them, some of them take a bit. I don't know. Ravi took you what, four, four or five years to build your Amiga Lego laptop that you finally finished recently. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's finished. <laughs> it is. It yeah, is. that's the point. Which is more than you can say for uh, Mark Brixius. Now, um, this is a YouTuber and he runs a YouTube channel called Raven Wolf Retro Tech. And he started a Commodore 64 RPG game back in 1984 that he still hasn't got around to finishing. So really, he's now on a mission. He said, look, this has been going long enough. And he's found all his original materials. Not all of them are in complete order, but he said it's always been kind of one of those loose threads in his life that he's really regretted not getting around to finishing this game. So he's made a YouTube video and he's got um, a little community around him on his YouTube channel as well. He basically needs the community's moral support and accountability he said to finally get this game finished after all these years i think this is a a really interesting thing you know um kind of creating an rpg back in 1984 you would have done it in a certain way there wouldn't have been all the tips and tricks that have kind of been learned over the 40 years and um kind of having asking people to help finish it i think that's really awesome. And it's it's got quite a nice collection, actually. Um, you know, it's from a Avalon Hill uh, tabletop game, which kind of we had Bruce Shelley on the podcast and he was talking about how Avalon Hill helped influence his game and uh, Age of Empires was one of them as well. Um, mm. So, you know, this this is great. It's, uh, it's interesting because I, I like the whole idea of collaboratively people helping you. You know, yeah. I can imagine... Back then, you would have found someone in a pub that had a bit of knowledge of something or said, oh, maybe I know someone that can help you out. But it would have been really hard. Whereas now you put it on the Internet, it's going to be thousands of people that will be adding suggestions and, you know, adding optimized code and uh, kind of making, you know, choices that, that would make a lot more sense and maybe stuff that you haven't thought about before. 
Yeah, I don't know if you watch, um, sometimes I watch Twitch channels of people coding and, you know, they'll have people watching them while they do it and they'll kind of give them feedback and stuff like that, which, you know, might be a good idea for him to do something like that. I think that would be an interesting watch, you know, kind of seeing him build a game in real time and obviously get an instant feedback. And the story of it is interesting. I mean, you mentioned the Avalon Hill tabletop games, and that is really what inspired this game. Uh, his game's called Digital Dungeon Master, and it was really inspired by those Avalon Hill games, in particular one called Telengard. It was his favourite back then. So it's kind of got influences of that and also Ultima Four. You know, there's kind of some surface world stuff in there as well. That, that was one of his favourite games back then. But what's interesting is, I mean, you think about how people made games back then. And I've, you know, I've got a lot of magazines here next to me from the 80s. And often it was a thing where they'd always say, if you were writing code on like a Commodore 64 or Spectrum, something like that, to actually write the code out on graph paper first. You know, actually write the code in pencil on a pad or something before you go anywhere near the keyboard. That was generally an encouraged thing back then. So it works out he's actually got kind of a lot of the materials that he made the game with back then, including handwritten notes on it. I love that, There's also a printout. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is kind of on graph paper and some cassette and discs, some of which load, but apparently there's not like the full game on there that's kind of uncorrupted. So he needs to kind of type in some of these listings again and test out a lot of these routines. He said he's got a load of handwritten and drawn notes and maps and how the game design works. But this is literally all just, you know, hand drawn on paper. It, so It makes me think, I wonder how many people out there have created games that haven't been finished and there's so many mm. unfinished projects and like, Actually, looking at this, um, you know, AI is really good at coding. If someone developed a game yeah. finishing AI that you put all your details in and then it kind of fixed it up and finished it off, that would be really interesting to see. That's not about it. I mean, I know Google Bard is meant to be better than ChatGPT, isn't it, for for writing code? I'm not sure how well it's going to handle a, a Commodore 64 RPG. I did try to do some um, Commodore basic programming using ChatGPT 4. Um, just like a few simple, like a Pong game for the Commodore 16. Yeah, that could be an idea. I mean, you know, th- those tools are out there when, you know, it, it does seem like there's definitely much easier ways to get support and people around you than there was, you know, when he started this game yeah. 40 years ago. So um, it's going to be interesting to see his journey. He's, he's made a, a nice little YouTube video about 15 minutes long that kind of goes into the history of the game and where he's at so far. So if you want to check that out, I'll, of course, put that. And the rest of the stories in our show notes at the retrohour.com. Now, one thing that I do quite like about getting my old system set up, you know, I've got got my PS2 out of the cupboard over the weekend and having a few games on that. It's always very cool, isn't it, to put your memory cards in on these old machines and kind of see where you got to in games. And, you know, sometimes you can kind of pick up your progress 10, 20 years later. That thing's very cool. And um, obviously, I mean, memory cards are fallible. You can lose them, you know, some of them quite small capacity back in the day. But this seems like a very good solution. If you're a GameCube fan, this is a brand new... They're calling this a pro memory card, the Memcard Pro GC, the next generation GameCube memory card. And this packs a lot of punch into a little card, doesn't it? it, it it's a lot of punch. I think it's very much overkill, but I kind of love it as well. Um, yeah. So this has been made by um, 8-Bit Mods, who have done a couple of these already. They did um, an N64 one that we uh, covered a few few weeks ago, maybe a few months ago now it had like a battery that kind of charged itself off the N64, so it would never die. You know, the N64 one has the batteries in it. This one's very, very different. It's kind of similar to a PS1, one they they put out a few months ago, but pr- pretty much, it, like you say, it's a memory card that packs a lot of punch. It's It's got an SD card slot in there, and I just want to get this out here, which can support from one gigabyte to two terabytes worth of memory, of you know, from, from a micro SD card. Um, one gig of memory for the GameCube is the equivalent of 2,048 standard 59 <laughs> block memory cards. Which is, So it doesn't sound to me like that there's not enough GameCube games out there to ever fill just one of them. No, I mean, if you were to put a two terabyte <laughs> SD yeah. card in there, you know, tens of thousands of uh, memory cards, you know, which have then all got 59 blocks on them, which is just absolutely incredible. Um, But that's obviously not the point of it. That's not, you know, to have tens and tens and tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of save slots for your classic GameCube games. I guess the point of it is for the longevity of it, you know, like you said, the preservation of your saves and stuff like that, because obviously you can take the SD card out of it and plug it into your computer and back these these saves up. But it also boasts uh, Wi-Fi capabilities, so you don't actually have to take it out your GameCube and take it out of the old, take the old uh, SD card out of there. You can actually just connect directly to your PC and do it that way, which is really mm. interesting. 
and it's very slick as well. It's got a little OLED screen on there as well. It um, looks a bit uh, VMU y, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. It does look a bit. Uh, um, I've, I've just noticed, I, don't, I, I didn't use the um, GameCube much, but was the memory card management that good? Because they're saying here that there's this really good uh, program called Swiss. And, and what that actually does is it enables um, gamer IDs to kind of be connected to the saves from a database. So you can organize your saves a lot easier. And, um, you know, when you boot into your title, that save will be relevant. And uh, that's a kind of killer feature on there as well. Um, it was, I mean, I never had a problem with the, um, you know, the memory card kind of interface of the GameCube. You know, you it was the classic, same as the PS2. You boot up the system without a disc in it or with the tray open, and then you just went to the memory card uh, management screen, and then you could only obviously have the two memory cards in there, and then it came up with all your games and, you, you know, your data on there and stuff like that. So it was it was fine, but, you know, like anything that has like a passionate kind of community behind it, these new modern technologies come out for retro systems, which are just absolutely overkill, but they're always yeah. cool. Well, this this is like, it looks like it's got a web-based interface. So what you do is, you know, you you have your card, you connect to it wirelessly, and then you go on your computer mm. and you can look up the contents of it and, you know, do different actions with it and yeah. kind of play around, which uh, I, I really like that idea that you can kind of call into the memory card. Yeah, and uh, they'll have, um, people will put their save slots for people to download, you know, uh, I remember as a, as a kid, uh, my brother actually borrowed another friend's memory card so he could transfer Metal Gear Solid data over on the PS1. So his friend would then have everything that we had unlocked on Metal Gear Solid to play around with. And I guess you'd be able to do that with this as well. So you'd go on, go online, go on this Swiss and you would go, okay, I want to find, I'm trying to think of a classic game, maybe Mario Sunshine with everything completely completed and unlocked so you can do explore everything on the island and you'd be able to download those saves, I imagine, as well as preserve your saves. Yeah, well, that is kind of one of the goals of it, apparently. Now, now Swiss is a, it's like a homebrew utility, so I think mm -hmm. that basically means you know, you've modded your GameCube so it can boot, boot yeah. like homebrew stuff. But it says if you've got like a, a Swiss-enabled GameCube, it will then automatically match your saves with the game name. So, oh, yeah. you know, saves are going through and sorting them out manually. But if you haven't, I mean, apparently what one of the goals of this is that eventually they're going to have kind of cloud game saving. Mm. So hopefully that will mean that, you know, number one, you, you, your saves are backed up on the cloud. But yeah, number two, you'll probably be able to share them with other people as well, which is quite good. One nifty feature, though, is obviously the GameCube has got two memory card slots. You can put your original card into slot two and then transfer your saves over to the um, the Memcard Pro. Yeah. So it can back up, you know, your original your original unit, which I think is quite nice. So I, mean, I, I don't think it's a problem that, you know, I don't think these cards are dying. No, I've not, I don't think I've it's, ever had a memory card fail on me. I, I'd <laughs> say it's honest, certainly but... for the hardcore, though, because it's £64 yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, for the thing. memory card. Now, I don't know how much they are usually, but I can imagine they're pretty cheap to pick up. Yeah. But, that's uh, seven yeah. quid, I think, yeah, from my seven. play expo. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so this is for the real hardcore kind of gamer. But then if you've got a terabyte worth of stuff on that, yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah must I mean, be dedicated. I, was, I mean, even <laughs> if you're getting them at a good price, like four or five pound per memory card, um, yeah. 2008, 2048 of them um, for just one gig's worth will set you back a little bit. So like you say, Ravi, if you wanted to get a terabyte <laughs> worth, that'd be a lot of memory cards, but still really over cool, but very cool. Yeah, definitely. There are, are available now. So if you want to get hold of one, I'll put a link in the show notes as well. Now, Atari seems to be a company that um, we haven't talked about for, for a few months, bizarrely. It used to like pop up in the news every single month. This is called, of course, Modern Atari. Nothing to do with the original company back in the day, as uh, this article on Ars Technica goes to great lengths to point out. But the uh, new Atari is releasing what they're calling the first brand new Atari branded 2600 cartridge next month. Uh, this this looks interesting. It's uh, uh, Run and Jump. Have, have you ever played that title? Well, it's a new game, this is. Oh, so okay. Um, I, thought, yeah. I thought it was like a, a classic re-release because I'm not quite sure with Atari, like who's running it nowadays and with stuff like the VCS coming out and, you know, all different titles. It, it, it seemed a bit kind of confused. I know there was a, a crypto coin at one point, but I kind of like seeing that they're, they're, they're going back to the legacy a bit and um, it's pretty amusing to see a, an Atari cart, 2600 cart with 2023 copyright Atari Inc., um, yeah. <laughs> at the very bottom. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, the modern Atari, I think it was Infogram, wasn't it? You know, they renamed themselves in like 
2008, 2009 to Atari, I believe. You know, I don't think they've been bought out again since. Pretty sure that's who it is now. Uh, but this is a game, yeah, it's called Mr. Run and Jump, um, a game that is coming out to all the big platforms. It's going to be on Switch, Xbox, PlayStation, Steam, Epic Games, and the new Atari 2600, I believe. But also, the uh, the reason we're talking about it here is they've done basically what we call a demake version of it. That's going to be pressed to a 2600 cartridge that runs on the original Atari 2600 from the 70s. So they're taking pre-orders for this right now. Um, well, no, sorry, it's from next month, July 31st is when the pre-orders start, uh, at a price of $59.99. So like a lot of these, I mean, this isn't by far, you know, they're saying this is the first new Atari branded game for the 2600 on cartridge since 1990. But of course, there's been like, you know, limited run games oh, and all and, that. And like Atari Age it's, it's, as yeah, well. They've, it's an Atari They've game. released some amazing stuff like... Um, there was also that Halo 2600. There's been tons of them, but yeah. this coming from Atari, that's the point of this one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I mean, you know, there have been stuff for Atari's 50th anniversary collections as well, which, you know, we've had physical releases for. But yeah, this is really the headline that it said, brand new 2600 cartridge, uh, a brand new game with the Atari logo on there. So if that's something you care about, <laughs> then, you know, you can actually get a new cartridge um, from Atari for your 46-year-old game console. The game itself, I mean, it looks very primitive. I've got to admit, I'm not the biggest fan of Atari 2600 games. They do feel just a little bit old school for me. I don't know if you guys are the same. They don't hold my interest Yeah, really it's, long. I, it's an area like, you know, when I see stuff like Ready Player One and stuff, I think this is yeah. an iconic area that I should be exploring more of. But I don't know, maybe I'm, I just ha- I don't have the patience for it nowadays. And uh, I really should. And I re- really should get into it because we've done so many episodes on it. And, yeah. you know, there's been some fantastic developments on it and uh, great stuff like, you know, Pitfall and... Um, some fantastic titles, and I really need to actually sit and, and just have a good Atari session. Well, I've got a 2600, um, and, you know, I can have a game of Pong on there and have a bit of fun, a bit of Breakout. It's a fantastic game. But then I'm always like, well, you know, I'd rather play Arkanoid on the Commodore 64. It just maybe feels just a little bit too kind of maybe pre my time. Maybe that's why it doesn't hold much kind of – because I haven't really got any nostalgia for it. I um, you know, first console I ever played was the NES. But I definitely understand that, you know, there is a hell of a lot of nostalgia for a lot of people around it. And, you know, I've got, like, the, the Atari 50 collection for the PS5. Find that really interesting to look at. You know, I'm a collector for the Jaguar. So I definitely know there is a market that will lap well, this well, up. Well, do you, do you think they would ever go and release an official Atari Jaguar game? You see, that would get you uh, really excited. Or, or Lynx. Um, you know, it would be interesting <laughs> to see other systems explored. If you'd have asked me that maybe a year ago, I'd have probably said no. But I think the fact that Atari did actually put out some Jaguar games on the Atari 50 collection... Makes me think that maybe there could be something to look at. So the thing about this is they're kind of doing it the a bit like limited run do the kind of pre order and then they make them on demand. Yeah, so, maybe, you know, maybe they're dipping they've... their toes into the like past and seeing which communities are big and yeah. what what's going to kind of sell, you know, and then maybe expand on that rather than building yeah, a th- new console that no one wants. <laughs> well, I mean, I think they've definitely learned lessons from uh, the Atari of days gone by that they're not going to make like you know. <laughs> a million cartridges and have to bury them in the desert somewhere. Yes, <laughs> yeah. It's definitely gone. Like 10 million <laughs> copies of this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that basically you pre-order it online, uh, two or three months later, it turns up. So I guess that means, you know, there's basically, you know, as many as I want to make copies of this. But again, I imagine it's one of these where there might only be one run of it. So if you're interested, I'll probably get in there now, you know, when pre-orders start, because I- I've got a feeling a lot of people will end up buying this and then it'll be on eBay for like, you know, Five hundred dollars in a couple of months' time mm. after they've all gone out there. But it's interesting. I remember when you guys had um, Pat the NES Punk on here, and he was kind of saying that you know when he goes to thrift stores and markets and stuff in America now, twenty six hundred games. It kind of feels have like peaked and come down the other side. Like you know the prices of them are actually quite cheap again now. Yeah, it kind of yeah. feels like everyone has kind of you know got the collection. They, 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 they want were now. all over the place when I was going to America. You know, in New York, in some of the stores, it was just. 2600 games everywhere and it was really reasonable mm. actually it was um yeah it was pretty amazing to see because you know over here they're, they're they're a lot rarer it's it's definitely not something i see at conventions a lot of and or or if i do it's the complete other way it's a really expensive pristine boxed one um, yeah but interestingly at the last market i worked at uh in the big one of the big bundles i had i actually had about eight atari 2600 games um, and one guy came and bought all of them. And they were all the Sesame Street games, interestingly, that came out for right. the 2600. And one guy just bought them all. Uh, I think I had them all on for about five, six quid. 
each. And what did he look like? Was he like a big bird? Uh, yeah, he was. Um, and then he <laughs> had a, a little guy in a trash can with him and a little red yeah. like guy with a really high squeaky voice. No, no, no. He was a normal just, guy and just came up, didn't haggle with me or anything like that. You know, just mm. maybe I just sold some really rare gems to him for like yeah. 30 quid. <laughs> keep me cool, keep me cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, kn- he knew what he wanted, just went in there. Yeah, don't yeah. say anything to the PlayStation guy, right? Go. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I don't tend to see him much in the UK. But yeah, I remember Pat saying, you know, they, they, they seem to have peaked and kind mm. of gone. And maybe it's just because of all the rare, the actual games that, you know, they didn't produce absolutely millions and millions of them. Have gone and or maybe the whole kind of like hype of the ET game and you know around 2010 you know with the AVGM film and everything where they were like you know kind of like uncovering it all and kind of getting the actual scoop it seems to be yeah. it's probably all kind of died down now an Atari game over which was yeah, yeah. a big one yeah yeah well, that's the thing I mean I, I'd hazard a guess if you're talking about Atari the 2600 I'd say has probably still got the biggest scene though you know more than like the Jaguar or the yeah. Lynx or the ST I, I certainly example. hear a lot more about it you know yeah. uh, especially doing this podcast and uh, yeah the Jag stuff you, that's very niche it's very niche but they they have been releasing it well that's the thing so it's uh, you know it'll be interesting to see how well this does and it's very cool that Atari are making games you know even if uh, you know we've talked about this before they'll generally do this kind of thing to get, you know, idiots like us talking about it, you know, because it gives them yeah. free PR, which, uh, you know, makes sense. It's a good move. So uh, if you want to pre-order that, uh, pre-orders are available from the end of next month. And I linked it up and everything else we talk about, you don't have to Google around. I'll save you the effort. Have a look in the show notes on your podcast app or head to our website, click them directly from the retrohour.com. Now, before we chat to this week's very special guest, get memories of Age of Empires, the fanning of Xbox Live, Mark Tirano coming up in just a minute. One sound that will be absolute music to your ears is this. Now, this is our wonderful sponsor, our friends at Shopify. And you know what that sound means? That means you've just made a new sale on Shopify. So if you use it, that is something you will love hearing. And Shopify is fantastic as well. Now, we've talked about this before. It is the all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business as well. And it does feel like now, you know, everyone's either got a bit of a side hustle going on or, you know, becoming their own boss as well. And Shopify basically takes all of the headache out of it. You know, no matter what stage you are with your business, if you sell anything online or even in person as well, it is the commerce platform that is revolutionizing millions of businesses all around the world. And I know you're a web developer and you're day job, Ravi, and I know before Shopify sponsored our podcast. When they initially reached out, you're like, oh my God, yeah, Shopify's great. It saves me yeah, so much work. Um, you know, maintaining kind of uh, shop systems, e-commerce can be a nightmare, uh, keeping it up to date. And uh, Shopify really does it all for you. And it's got that uh, kind of front end point of sale system as well, which is really fantastic. It's like got social media as well, which I'm absolutely off for that. So um, yeah. having something like this really helps. And for me, I mean, I, I've talked about my friend before as an author, and he was trying to do it all himself on his website with like, you know, WordPress plugins and, you know, trying to deal with, you know, getting addresses and shipping them out. It was a nightmare for him. Put Shopify on that, saved him all the headaches so he can focus on what he loves doing, which is writing books. And they cover all your sales channels, you know, across your social platforms, like Ravi said, Facebook, Insta, even TikTok as well. And uh, they also give you 24 seven help, which, you know, for a web developer like you, Ravi, I imagine that takes a lot of headache out of things. Just like updating that. WordPress plugins was half of my yeah. life. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so Shopify is ready to support you every step of the way. So we want you to give this a try as well, because no matter how big or small you are, Shopify will be there to empower you, give you the confidence to grow and take your selling and your business to the next level. So we want you to give it a try. And of course, we always get you the best offers. You can sign up for just one pound a month for a trial period by heading to this exclusive link. So they know that we sent you and you save a load of money as well. Head to Shopify dot co dot uk slash retro hour so that is shopify s-h-o-p-i-f-y dot co dot uk slash retro hour to take your business to the next level today and get ready to hear plenty of this and a big thank you to our friends at shopify for their support of our show now it's the last weekend of the month amazingly that does mean patrons hangout is coming up on sunday uh the second one this month because we're a bit late with the the may one but you know we love hanging out it's a good excuse and i know a lot of the uh, the patrons are coming along to kickstart next weekend so it'll be a bit of a bit of a pre-party yeah on sunday yeah night, it should be it? good it's it's going to be interesting actually meeting some of the patrons in real life yeah. I, I i can't wait because we've got uh, people coming from all over europe and uh I've even got people coming from America and this is just going to be crazy. We we meet up on video 
usually, but uh, seeing everyone, like um, you guys have kind of been wondering, oh, what's this person like? What's this like? And it's going to be great to actually have a beer and have a chat because, you know, these folks have supported the show um, for so long and uh, really important to us. And we're always very welcoming to new members as well, whether you come into Kickstart next weekend or just want to hang out with us virtually, we'd love to see you there. So this coming Sunday night, it's basically just a big Zoom call. We all get on there. We nerd out for a couple of hours once a month, normally last Sunday of the month. So if you get in there right now, good time to uh, sign up to Patreon. And also, if you're a gold member above, you'll get access to, uh, it'll be 36 episodes of our bonus podcast that we do every month called The Retro Hour After Hours. And we have got some new members to induct into the most prestigious high score table in the world of retro gaming. Hall of Fame! <laughs> and let's give a very warm welcome to our latest patrons, Sean Goggin. Ross Murphy. And James Hannigan. Who all joined us on Patreon over the last week. We massively appreciate your support. And if you'd like to join the Retro Hour Patrons community, all the details to sign up right now are at theretrohour.com. Right then, next, we're going to be going inside the world of Microsoft Xbox as original day, setting up Xbox Live, and of course, plenty of stories of developing on the Age of Empires series. With this week's special guest, Mark Tirano, is next on the Retro Hour podcast. This week on the Retro Hour, we're joined by Mark Tirano, and Mark is the lead designer of Age of Empires 2. He was the technical game manager at Microsoft Xbox and responsible for a lot of networking and really interesting stuff like Xbox Live. He also worked for the great Ensemble Studios. So, how are you doing, Mark? Doing great. It's good to be here. Thanks. Well, uh, we have a question that we always ask all of our guests, and this was, what was your first video game experience? When do you remember first seeing a video game? Very first one was the original Pong uh, at a pizza place. Um, I was pretty young, but it was it felt very magical. And then after that, uh, computer space video game, arcade games, you know, that kind of sets the spark. But I think, you know, I really got energized Um a few years, it wasn't that much longer later, um, making video games, um, making games. I was in high school um, working on the uh, early the Radio Shack PCs and things and started a business, but was making games the entire time, just infected, the, um, infected by games. The TRS-80 and... Uh, uh, the kind of kit computers. The, the, yeah, the early kit computers. Uh, I had an Amiga early on and couple of bootleg games and that look that was my only only bootleg games i'm sorry to say but uh, <laughs> uh there were some great things that were never released uh, for the amiga platform that just uh, circled around in the in the community but i loved all the early um uh, pc the amiga and and pc games so it sounds like you enjoyed programming did you ever think like you'd be able to make a career of this was there a point where you were like you know what, this is going to be my job? Or was it always just a hobby just for fun and you kind of fell into it? No, it was, a it, well, kind of a funny story. Um, I had been making games for fun, um, just for my for my own you know personal enjoyment uh, while working professionally in, in software development and worked for big corporations. I was at Mobile Oil and, you know, doing big industrial applications, running, uh, running pipelines and kind of doing advanced real-time stuff. And we were playing... Doom 2 in mm. kind of in the evening after work, somebody came by and said, oh, that's total misuse of mobile oils, computer services. You know, what are you doing? And uh, my manager was going to write me up for it. And mm. I had done like amazing work at mobile and revolutionized their systems. Meanwhile, my other friends were, they said, okay, you know, we're thinking about working on a video game. And so they were, uh, it was David Rippey, Chris Rippey were, working at Ensemble Corporation, working on this video game in the evening. And so my boss said, you know, we're going to have to reprimand you for misuse of company services for playing Doom. And I said, I quit. <laughs> and I went <laughs> over to Ensemble Corporation, which was then just a consulting company, yeah. um, working on a video game in the evening, um, which we called Dawn of Man. And that later became um, Age of Empires. Interestingly, like um, I, I saw in your CV, you were work you mentioned you were working for like banking systems and uh, yeah, a, a co company called Tandem Computers as well. Did um, that kind of offer much training and like background of the systems that helped you later on? Yeah, work because with systems. Um, so the Tandem Systems were known for nonstop; like they were extremely reliable. 
multiple CPUs running at once, um, uh, redundant systems for mission critical applications. So uh, my background, you know, I switched over to kind of real time systems, which was un- actually unusual in computers uh, in the day. Uh, but that really set me up to be a multiplayer expert later on because I had a lot of familiarity with robust um, multiplayer networking solutions um, and could really think about the challenges that would later make Age of Empires possible. So with the job interview with Assemble Studios, what what was that like? You know, you say your friends were already working there. Was it was it a bit of a grilling or was it quite a easy sidestep into it? And then it was, a bit of a follow-up question. Did they, <laughs> did they, did they let you play Doom at Ensemble Studios? <laughs> we played games every, every evening at Ensemble. So it was all gamers, which was great. Uh, Tony Goodman. So I, I don't know. There wasn't, I don't remember there being a whole lot of an interview. Um, yeah. Uh, I came on uh, Ensemble Consulting as a Delphi instructor, which was mm. Delphi was a, kind of database focused um, interactive computer language at the time uh, from Borland systems. And there weren't many Delphi people, but I was, I was doing Delphi work at, at mobile and they knew my Delphi work and I taught classes and things like that. So um, it was a pretty easy transition to ensemble corporation. Then there were Angelo Laden and Tim Dean were working on the game part-time. I was mm. teaching people Delphi and doing database applications for ensemble um, by day, and then in the evening we we work on Dawn of Man. I, I remember Delphi was uh, still quite popular for for quite a while. It went into into the kind of late uh, two thousand, you know, um, as as a quite dominant programming language. It, it was pretty brilliant. Um, I had a lot of appreciation for the beauty of the of the architecture uh, of Delphi. Um, I was wondering if you had any kind of background in um, role playing games or like uh, Dungeons and Dragons or I, anything. In- I was Were you a aware of that? <laughs> yeah, I was a dungeon master for many years with a ongoing campaign. I love storytelling, medieval reenactment, things like that. So I was definitely already had a passion for um, history and storytelling and uh, uh, and role play and things like that. That's fantastic because um, the whole kind of real time strategy scene and um, you know Age of Empires uh, r- really stood out and. Uh, very kind of like based on that board game world as well, uh, but, you know, translated onto the computer. Did that really appeal to you then? Uh, it did. We actually started out with something that was closer to civilization, but we were all playing uh, original Warcraft and and really enjoyed just the excitement and pace of, uh, of kind of playing multiplayer Warcraft. And sh- it actually shifted our our development focus to, you know, somewhere in between not quite as hectic as Warcraft, but uh, great strategic decision making that we wanted to keep from a civilization style game and depth um, along with the with the real time pace. And that was kind of the age became the age of empires formula. And uh, Warcraft was very much after like Dune and stuff like that. But it had a real a kind of a personality with some of the voices and, um, you know, some of the characters on there. Um, is that something that you wanted to kind of see on uh, Age of Empires? It, yeah, it definitely stood out and had a lot of character. Of course, it, you know, everybody loves the uh, the uh, original Warcraft sounds and it, it sticks with you. You know, I really wanted to have um, a- actual historical voices and bring you know, some of that, the character of the world uh, in through the voices. Um, and it got really lucky to be able to do that with uh, with Age of Empires 2 and had, you know, authentic voice recordings for, um, you know, all the villager voices and things like that. In my brain now, I just want to do all the voices, but it is, it's an absolute <laughs> mix of Age of Empires 1, 2, The Conquerors, and Age of Mythology. <laughs> so- it, it, <laughs> It after enough, you it all mixes together for me. Yeah. <laughs> for me too. Kind of a best of, and uh, uh, I, the the big daddy for the car cheat as well just keeps coming into my head like the vroom, whenever you were uh, moving it around yeah. the board. So, um, how closely did you work with Bruce Shelley, and were you aware of his legacy at the time? Oh, of course. Um, yeah, Bruce, you know, had his uh, like all the games that he worked on, and he had always had lots of stories about 
uh, working with Sid on Civilization and the Railroad Games and things like that. But Bruce is such a humble, easy to work with guy. You know, you would never, you, you know, it's, it's just somebody that loved talking about games. He, he was really great to work with. Bruce would come and hang out with us, for, you know, for a week at a time at the studio. And uh, it was it was really a lot of fun. I, I, I really appreciate working with Bruce. And we, I think I learned, um, definitely picked up a lot of game design things just sitting around at, at uh, dinner time, kind of at the end of the day uh, and hearing his stories. It must have been fun um, just having Bruce around. Did you did you end up doing any kind of board games or, or D&D with Bruce as well? We we had a huge board game library at Ensemble Studios. It, so we played things like everybody played all the time. I don't have any particular memories, but it was always it was always really fun. And for hiring people, you know, we would get dinner and either, you know, play games out like um, a pool and pinball and things or bring most of the time would bring people back to the office and play board games with them because you really find out a lot. It's a there's a lot of interview you can pack into a couple of hours of board gaming. Well, um, how important was the uh, Genie engine? You know, having our own engine um, really let us do the things that we needed to do for RTS. Uh, Dave Pottinger did some really, really innovative work in AI. And I think, you know, in that era, the commercial engines weren't as flexible as having your own engine. So it was it was an expensive thing to maintain. And, you know, there was a lot of work that went into architecting engine. But in the end of it, you know, we had something that was really, really well suited for RTS games and was extremely well optimized for the kind of gameplay that we wanted that I don't think um, in the engines of that time, you know, we would have gotten the same performance or been able to do the same things. Also, because we built it ourselves, we knew kind of where the weaknesses were too. So we mm. could, uh, we could avoid those issues. But yeah, I, I think it was important that, you know, we were able to realize the kind of games that, that we wanted to make with our own engine. Um, was there a in-house editor as well? Yes. Like that helped speed up development. Yeah. And we continually made tools um, that, that worked with our, uh, with our engines. I guess part of my um, becoming a lead designer for Age of Empires 2 had to do with the engine. Um, uh, when I was talking to Rick Goodman, he said, you know, well, the engine's kind of getting tired. Like, I'm not really sure if it's got much life left with it. You know, do you think, you know, we could get a few more games out of it? And I said, there's an infinite number of games like, I could go on and on about it. He said, really? And so I was still a software engineer at the time and I started doing game design treatments, like a two or three page treatment of a of a game. And I did one every day until mm. he said stop. So I had done like 35, <laughs> <laughs> 35 game designs uh, by the time he said stop. And I think um, that definitely influenced him when he recommended me for a lead designer for Age of Empires 2. That's awesome. Did um by any chance did Asian mythology kind of come out from those kind of ideas? Because I had a real soft spot for Asian mythology. Me and my wife, when we first started going out, was the game we were playing together. <laughs> so real, real soft spot for it there. You know, Age of Mythology was in large part because the artists at Ensemble were really tired of doing historical stuff. Yeah, they wanted to have more flash, more excitement. Mm. Um, and things that just really didn't fit with the historical legacy of the yeah. Age of Empires brand, you know, for the health of the studio. And we, I could think we all kind of needed that break. And, you know, we love mythology and, and storytelling as well. So the shift to Age of Mythology, I think, was good for the health of Ensemble Studios to just take a deep breath in and, and really try some exciting new things. So they got yeah. to do a lot of really cool animation and effects work and, and things like that as part of it, the age of mythology uh, yeah. ex experience. Just have some fun with it, I guess as well. Yeah, exactly. So um, just the last question about the first age of empires was, you know, how did you work on improving the multiplayer aspects and, you know, what challenges did you face kind of implementing that back in 1997? So the challenges, it, it was impossible. <laughs> mm. Everybody thought it was impossible <laughs> Um, and that's why, you know, I wrote the paper about some of the things that I did. It was 1500 archers on 2088. Like most of our audience was still dial up users. 
Mm -hmm. Um, and to move that number of units around was not possible to send the locations of all those units over a 28 dial up connection. So the thing that I invented was simultaneous simulations, which were two, like every copy of the game, um, was starting with the same world setup and Mm -hmm. would simultaneously issue each person's commands every turn. Right. So it would synchronize, send everything out and run it on all the machines, which was wound up being a pretty complex thing to pull off because machines were of wildly different specifications Mm. and the networking was unreliable with uh, lots of drops and things. So most of my time was really spent getting that technology to work and synchronizing all the machines so they ran perfectly together. They didn't have to, each machine could run at its own speed, but the uh, multiplayer was synchronized. You know, when with the era of client server and high speed internet, um, that was no longer needed. But at the time, I pretty much invented the only solution that would let you run that number of units around on the board um, mm. over dial up. How important was that kind of multiplayer aspect to Ensemble then? Were they like really? wanting it to happen and uh, uh, to work well, or was it just kind of a an extra? Um, we were all, everybody in the office was kind of multiplayer competitive fans. Like we loved the competition. You know, we loved that um, kind of in your face warfare. It really was different. I mean, we invested in multiple areas. So just having random maps meant, you know, if you're playing single player against the AI, you could play again and again. Uh, Dave Pottinger's AI was breakthrough in so many areas um, for Age of Empires. So that gave the game a lot of single player longevity. But there was a lot of commitment to, you know, bringing that multiplayer experience to people. And, you know, we even, and it for me, I'm bl- sorry bl- if I blur between Age of Empires and, and Age 2, but, you know, extending the experience with our own editor and things like that, we really wanted people to engage in a number of ways um, around the Age of Empires game. So even if that was, I can, you know, record a game or I can make a map for my friends um, asynchronously, or we can get online and we can play together in lots of different configurations, you know, 2v2v2v2 2v2 2v2 or 4v4 or, mm-hmm. you know, 3 and 3 and have maps and have modes and things that would support lots of different ways that players could play together that's awesome so you were obviously we mentioned previously you were the lead designer on age of empires 2 and i absolutely adore age of empires 2 i actually remember waking up christmas day one day and getting age of empires 2 with my brother um so a really really fun christmas that was what was your vision for this title you know like you know you wrote out every day for 30 days writing out you know all these different possibilities for the games and stuff like that what was your kind of like ideas and vision going into that game at the start? You know, I really loved uh, the Middle Ages, um, the history, you know, everything. There was so much rich world conflict going on and so much foundational technology and things that was happening all over the world. And with Ace of Empires 2, it tried to make it not, everything was not Eurocentric, you know, what was going on uh, with with Saladin and and things like that. So some of the stories were, you know, I wanted to be a little bit more world stories and not quite so European focused. Although there's of course a lot of Europe because a lot of things were, were going on in Mm. history then. But, um, you know, so the vision, I mean, it's lead designer. I look at as, as really editor and curator of the best ideas of the studio is I can try to infect people with a vision, but really it's a team effort. And, you know, the best ideas can come from anywhere. So, you know, it's nice to have the title of, of lead designers, but really it's, you know, coalescing the best ideas of the team into something mm-hmm. that makes sense as a whole. So, you know, I could start out with a vision and some of the things I, you know, I wanted to do really didn't work for the pace of the game that I had to discover by trying them out. Some of those things we, we prototyped. Um, I had wanted to do deeper diplomacy system like more Mm. nuanced things where you could make and break agreements a little bit you know diplomacy style so there was some uh strategy but it just didn't really fit with the um with the real-time pace 
you know, so simplified that and was happy with the with the options that we had for for trade and 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 building alliances. Another system was um, raiding. I wanted the raiders, uh, various raiding tribes, to be able to come in and just take things, you know, um, loot and pillage, um, and build their civilization based on what they could take from other players um, or a diplomatic solution where you could just pay them tribute out of your economy directly. So, you know, but trying to balance those different types of gameplay didn't, didn't work out as, as well as I'd hope. So that was another thing that, that we abandoned. Interestingly, um, I, I remember um, Age of Empires was available on the MSM uh, game zone. Uh, which uh, was first called The Village uh, back in 1996. Right. It was like a really old kind of gaming platform. But, um, you know, uh, it's really interesting because you look at stuff like Steam now and uh, that was a, a real pioneer. What was it like kind of working with that? Well, we were really helping push them into new new areas. So um, some of the technology I worked with, the MSN Gaming Zone, um Jason Robar, Leon Pryor, I really wanted, you know, they had the game tables system where you could sit down and you'd sort of join a cha- table and you could chat and and pick games. Um, I wanted to have certain types of modes be available right from the zone and have that launch the particular kind of game experience you wanted. Uh, and they were s- supportive of that. So we gave that a try. It ended up most people wanted to play the game that most other people were playing but I wanted to have separate tables for um, Regicide and Wonder Victory and things like that. But it, in the end, the players just wanted the the best matches from the biggest community, I think. so. But it was a good experiment. And the Zone was really on board with trying different kinds of launch strategies to make a good experience for players to really, you know, let people um, stay together as a team and, you know, play game after game together out of the lobby yeah it was it was really interesting because i remember they had this um it was like a cd-rom matchmaking service as well like later on where you would uh you know uh be able to meet other players and and kind of connect and all these extra features it was kind of nice having sort of casual and board game type experiences mixed in right there where people could launch age of empires you could see what your friends were doing so i appreciated what they what they started they kind of lost momentum after a while and i was sad when you could no longer you know they shut down the zone and you could it kind of abandoned age of empires players but the community stepped up and made other other ways you could you know you could still play the game which i'm i'm glad that that the fans were you know made multiplayer happen uh, even when they were abandoned by the platform what did you think of the uh, console versions of age of empires and did you have any involvement in them that was kind of where publisher deals that happened. Um, we didn't even get copies, mm. <laughs> which was, which was weird. Um, yeah. So I think we got, we got to test them, but it was, I don't know, whenever those tests came up, we were always really in the middle of, you know, making a build or getting ready for E3 or something. It never seemed like it was convenient. So I think mostly the, um, the test department, got in and really exercised those games. So I, no, I didn't get too much into into the console versions. Yeah, they're, they're quite well known because they were um, really good, actually. They had some like real different features uh, specific for the consoles. But um, I was also wondering, did you have any involvement with a definitive issue? Because um, lots of these kind of DLC and add-ons were all put into that uh, edition. Um, no, I didn't work on the definitive edition at all. I appreciate the the passion because I think that helped, you know, after we did Age of Empires 2 HD, which kind of let Microsoft know that it was really viable in the in the current marketplace. That's what kicked off sort of the official interest in um, bringing M- Age of Empires back again. I think after Microsoft tried the Age of Empires online um, and they invested in that for a while, it didn't live up to, I don't know what expectations they have, but you know, after that, it was kind of quiet for a while. And uh, Matt Pritchard was somebody I worked with on original Age of Empires. He said, you know, 
there's there's still a lot of interest and a lot of fan community. Um, you know, do you think it'd be possible to do Age of Empires again? And so we talked to the um, licensed people at Microsoft and you know wanted to find out what their feelings were about it. And at uh, Hidden Path, you know, we made Age of Empires 2 HD happen uh, as an official title, and Microsoft. We, we did really good numbers for a 20 year old game, you know, to just, we fixed all the things that all the systems that had gotten broken over the years, the uh, multiplayer and um, rendering and things like that. Redid all that pretty much made the same, you know, the game kind of looked and played the same, which was our goal, but it was on all modern technology and it did really good numbers. You know, people still love the game. It was still fun. I got hooked again you know, after not having played for so long, still had the magic for me. But that reignited Microsoft's interest and made, uh, I think, all of the the definitive edition and all the renewed interest in uh, of Empires 4 and everything followed on from, from that work. So uh, obviously you kind of touched on Microsoft or you mentioned Microsoft there. You uh, eventually became the uh the technical game manager at Microsoft Xbox. What What's the story there? How did you transition? So at Microsoft acquired uh, Ensemble Studios mm-hmm. and I was really, you know, I looked at um, consoles and I said, console seems like a really um, rich development um, environment for games. And I saw a lot more happening in consoles, a lot more investment and interest. So I said, I wanted to, you know, find out more about, uh, you know, the Xbox which had been announced, um, but the Xbox space. And it turns out that, uh, the lead tester on Age of Empires 2, uh, Mark Thomas, was actually the head of developer relations and the lead uh, technical game manager. Um, what Microsoft was trying to do is provide really great technical and design support for developers to make um, Xbox kind of a, a premier development platform um, to compete against Sony. So. You know, they knew they had an uphill climb to be a legit platform. And by making Xbox a great development platform for developers, they knew that they could win. So the philosophy was get people that have really made games and really know what they're doing and just staff with game experts. And uh, so I came on and was a kind of design and technical advisor for developers on Xbox. So I got to launch... um, Xbox, uh, Xbox Live, and Xbox 360 Live is at Microsoft. Well, Xbox Live was really interesting because uh, a lot of consoles had uh, tried to do like online multiplayer and uh, struggled in the past. Uh, what do you think made Xbox Live different? And uh, at what point did you realize it had really broken through and uh, it became something that was massively successful? The, you know, Bill Gates' commitment and the, all the leadership at Xbox commitment to multiplayer is what made it happen because the numbers at the time didn't justify putting a high speed internet port on the xbox if you had said what does the audience have right now it was ridiculous to add that much expense to the console to support high speed internet but the commitment was you know if we have a great experience and if we have the facility more people will get high speed internet they'll have a reason to and you know it was just that forward looking commitment to multiplayer play that I think made the difference. And then with Xbox Live, you know, having a rich feature set, we also made um, a lot of things so developers wouldn't have to roll their own. Because one of the things that made multiplayer hard was, oh, I need to make a matchmaking system and I need to make like all this infrastructure. We tried to have that already done on Xbox Live so developers could just plug into something that worked really well. And I think that was a successful model um, since everybody ended up you know having it sort of rich multiplayer services and community um, platforms with consoles i uh, i remember certain aspects of um, xbox live like the voice messages you could do there was all these fantastic features like uh, you know achievements and you could check other people's achievements um, do you think kind of it launching a bit later than the xbox launching itself uh, really helped uh, kind of give a bit of time for development yeah it needed more time and it's it's funny you know we all take achievements for granted and that's part of every game and every game platform 
but it was I was in the meeting where it was proposed and it was it was controversial. You know, should we do should we do that? Is that worth investing in? It's funny to think about it, but that you know, that could have gone either way of whether that achievements happened or got cut. So, you know, I was all as a, from a designer sent to me, you know, I'm, I'm all on board for uh, reward systems, especially at the platform level and making a, a structured plan. So every game can have a set of achievements and players can kind of compare their progress. And, you know, it was really kind of revolutionary, but at the time, you know, it was just another topic in a meeting and you don't know how big a thing is going to be. You know, it's just great to have people who are passionate about making a better experience for for gamers and, you know, the best communities that they could make at one feature at a time. How important was stuff like um, the SDK and, um, you know, you had relationships talking to developers about stuff like the API and did you have to do much kind of convincing and uh, trying to get people on board to have this uh, multiplayer aspect to their game? It, it, was, it was sort of two camps. So some people really wanted to, you know, add multiplayer functionality and do it right to their game. You know, other people were not kind of not too sure on the investment. And some people like inappropriately wanted to put in multiplayer features that just didn't really work for their game, but thought they needed to have it in the marketplace. So, you know, it's always great to sit down with game developers and say, you know, what's your vision for what you want to make? You know, what do you want to do for the audience that you can't do now and help them solve the technical and design issues, you know, so they can do that. You know, we really tried to, as a, in my technical game manager years, um, help developers realize their vision. And in some cases that was, you know, creating um, a cool multiplayer experience. And in other cases it was saying, hey, you know, maybe multiplayer is not a thing you should focus on. You know, that's not the value that you're delivering for players. So it's, it's just really helping people you know, make their best games. You mentioned uh, obviously being in the in the meeting for the achievements, and obviously not quite understanding how legendary and uh, impactful that would be, and kind of like the future of gaming and stuff. But one one question that kind of came to mind when you were talking about that, then what was kind of like the developers' kind of first reaction to like Xbox, Microsoft saying, "Right, you've now got to put these achievements in. There's going to be a thousand points per game." Because some games, you know, I'm thinking of Dead Rising, really took that on board. Capcom and you know, they went out there and, you know, put 50 achievements in there over 20 points. And some other games would put one achievement in for complete the game, a thousand right. points. Was there much of a, a pushback from some developers or was it kind of embraced straight away? Do you know? There's anytime you put something in the TCRs, <laughs> there's there's pushback mm. um, because everybody's at, you know, is at different places in their launch cycle. But I think generally yeah. people were excited about it. We tried to make the feature as as easy as possible for developers to implement. But if it's, you know, add more work and people have already been crunch type scheduled for months, they're, it's not everything could be well received no matter um, how good you do. But I think, you know, people could see the value. You know, I, when you're introducing something new, um, there's always an adjustment period. But once people mm. got to see it and started to play with it, they were like, okay, this really adds something. You know, I had my own internal struggles with pop-up toast you know the um, little pop-up notifications of things yeah like players entering in you know, uh, on your friends list coming in and out like i really wanted to protect the experience from sort of the external notifications of the game system so putting you know i always felt my role in representing um game developers was to make sure we put the experience first mm. and the platform didn't get too full of itself, right? Where the um, achievement quest didn't overshadow what you were doing in the game and what you were feeling in the game. So giving developers control over that, you know, when pop-ups could happen, where they occurred, things like that, was all important to me that that the features respected the primacy of the experience. Yeah. Well, um, Defense Grid was a, a really interesting title and that kind of originally came out on the arcade and on, on the 360. Um, it was, it was known as Last Stand originally. Um, what happened there and what, why was it changed? Uh, trademark, <laughs> everything is, 
funny when you go through the trademark process for game names, you start like you're calling something one thing through development, like, you know, for a really long time. And then you get into the trademark year and it's like, okay, well, we threw out our first 50 ideas, you know, now we're at this compromise idea. You know, the the story for Last Stand, um, you know, it was in my initial view for the game, humanity had been at peace for so long, they forgot how to wage war and they got attacked by aliens and uh, invaded and were totally unprepared. And your role as a player was to rekindle like defense grid. The awakening was to reconnect with the old battle systems and, and defend humanity from this alien invasion. That story changed a little bit over time, but that was what the original concept was. Um, so as the last stand, as you were, you know, kind of almost solo um, along with your, with Fletcher, you know, your AI companion, defending humanity so pretty much it you know when i went back and read my original pitch for last stand in internal pitch it's you know 90 percent um the game as it was imagined so just the just the name change for for trademark rules really and that was uh oh. michael and austin and i were uh we played a little desktop tower defense early on and i said this is magical like we need to do this high end and people thought we were crazy it's like why would somebody pay for games that they can get for free flash games for free he said but that's not exactly what we're making and you know really wanted to make a high end uh tower defense game i I was gonna say because um you know defense grid was uh, a really interesting title originally but had tons of fans and then you did crowdfunding for uh, defense grid two and um th- that was like a million pounds and um it was fantastically successful and got ported to so many systems um th- why did you do crowdfunding was it because people were kind of unsure of if the title would be that popular we had a growing fan base it was it was really weird and kind of defied the publisher expectations is that our audience grew year after year. Usually you get a big spike at the beginning and then it and then it trails off. But people more people kept coming in to uh, defense grid over time. And so we thought that you know by going directly to the crowd we could free ourselves a little bit from some of the publisher politics. There were some weird weird stuff happen that I can't really go into, but the publisher relationship can be messy. And we generally had good publisher relationships, but they can do some shenanigans. And we were really hoping to interact directly with our audience who love the game and get the bulk of our funding for uh, for Defense Group 2. Crowdfunding campaigns are a ton of work. And I think, you know, with the, between the perks and the amount of extra work and stuff, we we spent almost as much as we took in on the yeah. campaign. So it was... It was great for getting the word out, and that, which is the thing we really knew we needed to do. Like people love the game. If we could just get more people aware of it, you know, that was going to be good for us. So as a little studio, we never had much marketing money, but crowdfunding gave us uh, that opportunity. Awesome. I mean, it, it did it do just over a million? Was it in the end on the crowdfunding? Yeah, which, um, which is massive. It depends how you count it. That was what we did in direct sales but yeah it was also uh you know as a i forgot what the xbox program was at the time where you would get the you know games for a month or whatever so lots of people got got to play it and yeah so i don't know exactly how to count yeah (laughs) you know (laughs) so of retail sales yeah it was over 1.2 million i think Um, um and the expansion packs did you know when we when the original game was available, then we got more expansion pack sales, um, which was great. Um, That's awesome. So um, Hidden Path Entertainment, you know, you founded that yourself. What, what's the story there? What made you think, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to now do my own game studio. You know, I've got all this experience. Tell us about that. So I was sitting down with, with Jeff Pops and we both worked for Xbox. You know, we were both kind of missing, like we were at the point after 360 had launched and we we're kind of in that, what next, you know? Um, and Jeff said, you know, if you were going to make a game, what game would you make? 
And I told him and he said, you know, we have to make a studio and go make that game. What I had imagined at the time was a game called War Council. And it was kind of a massive, like an MMO RTS where the individual battles were playing a full RTS battle. But then there was at a different pace, a strategic game that played out turn-based where you're kind of um, taking over territory by playing a hundred games of Age of Empires. And it was factional combat, you know, designed for thousands of players on a procedurally generated um, world map. So that was kind of how it went. So it, it was multiple games at once. There was a really rich, it was the rich diplomacy game that I wasn't able to, able to put in Age of Empires. And then a solid, um, fast paced 15 minute uh, tactical game, um, which was for me the the middle 15 minutes of an Age of Empires game that was the most exciting. So that's kind of the game that we wanted to make. We got about halfway done with it and our our publishing partner decided they didn't want to make games for the West anymore and wanted to focus on China. So uh, we had to shelve it. But I was really sorry to never be able to finish that game. I think it would have been pretty awesome. Mm, that's a shame. Well, um, Age of Empires 2 HD edition, uh, you mentioned earlier that you did that, but I also saw that you did... Um, uh, CSGO, uh, which yes. is uh, <laughs> just such a huge title. And it was famously originally started of, as a mod. What was it kind of like working with that uh, franchise? Did you go from, um, was it Counter-Strike Source and right. then go into uh, CSGO? Our, our goal, so Valve is an experiment company, right? They, they are always going, what can we learn about our audience or what can we learn about games? Their whole operation is is doing high quality experiments and and seeing what works out most of their biggest successes have just been experiments that a few people do and they go well it's going to see how this goes well cs was one of the most popular games in the world and it wasn't valve wasn't really monetizing it and they said you know we want to see how this will do on console so um cs go started out as a console game for for Xbox and PlayStation to try tax shooters on console. So that's why there was a radial menu. Um, lots of choices were about the user interface and things for CSGO were to make a great console experience. Um, so we did that and uh, I can't remember what the initial, I think it was eight months. Um, we had to do a console port and we came back and sat down with Gabe and uh, Chet Falsek, and we said, okay, here it is. And Gabe played, and he goes, uh, that's Counter-Strike, uh, you know, on console. And he said, well, we have a problem now. Uh-oh, you know, what's the problem? He said, well, nobody's ever done on time, and we expected it was going to take you another six months. So what would you do with six more months? And so we told him, he said, oh, you know, go off and do that. So we added a bunch of features, um, uh, you know, rebuilt the, like the combat systems and things were all very legacy. So each weapon was done as a different uh, DLL and things. So we, we made, you know, tried to exactly keep the CS gameplay, but um, changed all the underlying technology. So it was maintainable and systems driven. We made a bunch of uh, aesthetic changes and things like that and came back and they said, wow, this is fantastic like keep going we want to you know do more things so we just sort of kept going um then we had a pax uh pax show for which was you know we thought was going to be not a huge game and the line was twice around the block um for csgo and it really took valve by surprise i think to see that there was still so much interest in um what a counter-strike sequel would be so our mission then sort of shifted to bring all of the enhancements we had made kind of on the PC first platform and unite the, all the various Counter-Strike audiences onto one experience. So we really wanted a blend of CS1.6 and CS Source, um, you know, to have that right game feel. So we spent a lot of time working with the top um, pro gamers in the world um, with Valve data analytics, uh, things like that. So we were really wanted a hybrid 
game feel and fix a bunch of bugs and things. And just literally went through a long process to make an esport for the whole community and bring everybody together to one tournament platform. And it's uh, it's such an important title. Um, like if you think of Half Life and Counter Strike, those were really the kind of titles that made Steam in those early days. Yes. And um, having stuff like references to you know the the map dust has been you know recreated by a, an artist in Germany. Like this is a a huge kind of cultural thing. Did you find it really important to have those older aspects and the traditional ones implemented with the quick responses and the kind of fast speed of CSGO. So, you know, CS players look at their time as an investment in spe- really specific skills. So it was important to preserve like all that investment that, you know, 10,000 hours of play that players had put in to get mastery of, of Counter-Strike. So, you know, having the classic maps be pretty much beautified, but the gameplay largely untouched uh, was important. We took the least popular maps um, and started there to to really learn how to do maps and source and things like that. Our, our team sat down with the best Valve artists as well, you know, preserving all the all the maps across both console and um, min spec PCs um, and making them performant on the engine. Like all those were challenges, but I think it's was really you know, can we capture 100% of the Counter-Strike skill that people had um, and apply it to, to new things? And I think that's been sort of the Counter-Strike legacy. I think they've done that with, with CS2 also, you know, to to keep the best things um, preserved uh, as as legacy for the franchise is is really important for Valve and it, and it definitely was, uh, was for us. So obviously, you know, CSGO has become culturally a phenomenon you know it's huge and i think there was even uh i'm sure the world championships were only going off this month as well the early ones have you ever witnessed you know any of the big counter-strike competitions in person have you ever actually seen it in person and the, you know like the the hype of it i did um so i was very involved in the world cyber games um and went to korea and it it was amazing i, I think the most impactful like having the best players in the world sitting right in front of you. Like, so like Valve flew in the top CS players from around the world um, when we were still tuning CSGO and got their raw feedback um, and watched them play. And watching these people in person, how they communicate, um, how they think about the depth of the economy, it was such an education for me as a designer at the level that humans are capable of playing, it looks like they're psychic. They are so tuned around the you know the relationships between space and weapons um, and their own bodies. It's it is really it's amazing. I mean, you can get one sense of it to be in person in the arena, and it's fantastic with the spectacle and the you know the shout casting and you know, knowledgeable announcers who are helping explain the plays but just watching people interact with a game to such a degree and i had that experience with age of empires play pro players as well is watching someone that has mastered a thing that you worked on to a degree that exceeds what you could even imagine it's it's magical in a way it's really hard to explain but it's it's incredible to see that um live Well, you've wrote uh, a few books on uh, games design and uh, kind of papers. I I was wondering if there's any that you recommend for people looking at getting into games design. I haven't written any books. Um, You know, maybe a few years from now, I'll have some time to sit down and do it. Um, One paper I did, um, the right method, R-I-T-E, was a system that we made with Age of Empires, in the user research and testing to that revolutionized how games are, are tested now, like how studies are done of players when they're playing a game. Um, before this, we, we came up with this method. People would sit down and they would record how many times people failed doing a particular task. Like we said, Oh, take a group of, of soldiers and move them from one area to another. And they would, have them do that, and then they would see how many times people were successful in doing that task. 
that was how it used to be. And then the developer would get a report that would say 60% of the people were able to do this thing successfully. And then they would make changes. Well, I was in the room with the Microsoft user researchers and I said, you know, everybody is going to get this part wrong because of the way we're explaining it. Let me just fix that and we'll see if the next people can do it. So it was really putting iterative design into the testing um, and making it a collaborative process between game design and um, user research that let us focus on letting people have a great experience. And it really changed how game um, user research was done and and how games were made. And so I feel like I'm, that's an important contribution, but it took the Microsoft people being willing to change their process and game designers being willing to engage with that part of the study. It used to be hands-off, but making that um, a collaborative process was a much more you know, game design way to, to make games end to end. Um, so I was really happy with that, that particular one. And I'm happy that it's continued for 25 plus years. Um, and it's still being used today. So, uh, our final question is, um, what are you doing these days? You're currently with mountaintop studio, mountaintop studios. Uh, we're working on an exciting competitive title, um, Mm -hmm. which if people know the things that I've worked on, um, I think uh, they will be happy to check it out and we'll, uh, we'll be, haven't announced it yet, but we'll be announcing more. We've got several positions open for environment artists right now, but uh, yeah, keep, uh, keep follow me on uh, uh, any of the social medias on uh, LinkedIn or yeah, I'm happy to pretty much connect with anybody on, on LinkedIn, but uh, we'll have more announcements, you know, at, major game conventions. I mean, not really sure where we're going to announce, but uh, I, I think that's all I can say right now. <laughs> <laughs> sounds, sounds like exciting stuff, though. Uh, we, yeah. we look forward to hearing about it. Well, Mark, it's been amazing having you on and uh, such a journey. Uh, thanks for joining us. Yeah, a game we didn't talk about was um, Brass Tactics, which um, is only available in VR, but if people get a chance to check it out, I was really proud of that one. I, I tried to kind of bring the Age of Empires feel to VR. Uh, and I think it was really, like, it's one of the games I'm most proud of of having made, though not many people have had a chance to play it. Uh, I really loved making it, and it was uh, uh, I think the best VR real-time strategy experience uh, that I could imagine. So, we've well, we've got uh, lots of listeners with VR systems, so we'll definitely put that in our show notes, and uh, you know, you might get some new players on that. It sounds like an <laughs> awesome title. Great. Oh, Thank you so much, Mark. Really good hanging out with you guys.